Hey guys, welcome to the shop. Today we got two projects that we're gonna to try to get sorted. One is that my wife complains every time she rides in this thing, that makes her hair stink. I can't have that. She's not gonna to wanna to ride in this thing if every time she gets out of it, she grabs her hair. You guys have probably seen it. Smells it and says, my hair stinks. Let me show you why I think that that's happening. We'll get that sorted because it is top priority. Uh, and then we're gonna break into the dual milling machine, get it unboxed unburied probably more accurate uh, description because it's been a long time since I've worked on that and we need to get it ready to start going back together. I'm excited to get that thing you know going together. Thanks for watching. So Elizabeth is not one to complain but when it comes to her, her hair you know maybe on occasion I'll hear something about it and I've heard a couple times that she said every time I ride in your truck my hair starts stinking can't have that because then she's not going to want to ride in this thing tucked up all next to me on this bench seat if you put bucket seats in one of these that originally come out with a bench seat, you've obviously not lived the life that I have, so I can't have her not wanting to ride in this thing. So let me show you what I believe is the problem, and we will get that sorted. At least we'll try to. Oh, I got my step stool here. Kind of cool outside, and the old bones are aching, actually. Let's see if I can get in here. Good thing about these big engine bays is you can just kind of crawl in here and work on them. Now, Here's the deal. Up until this point, I have just been running a crankcase vent on my valve cover right here. Any blow by, any, you know, turned up oil or anything, especially after you run down the road really hard and then you stop at a stoplight, those exhaust gases or blow or combustion gases that get inside the engine get vented out of this vent and they you know, fill up the under the hood here and get sucked in the vent because we've been running the heater. It's been kind of cool lately. Gets sucked into the vent and, you know, starts smelling a bit on the inside of the truck. I can't have that, right? So we got to find an alternative. And what I'm going to do and what I should have done from the beginning is run a PVC system, a positive crankcase ventilation. Hear that? It's a little check valve. So we're going to put this in place of this we're going to run it through an oil catch can, this, mounted somewhere here, and then back into the intake so those gases get burnt, you know, cycle through the engine and go out the exhaust instead of under the hood and into the vents, making my wife complain. So here is a quick look at our oil catch can. This is a relatively cheap model, come off uh, Amazon actually a viewer picked it up for me and I appreciate that I should have already plumbed it in but I haven't so let's give you a quick rundown at least how I believe this works so through that PVC valve the gases will get pulled in to the inside here they will have to come across a uh, bunch of steel wool here which will hopefully condense that oil and cause it to drip and uh, you know collect inside of the bottom part of this container here and then the rest of the vapor will get pulled through the outside and back into the intake and then go through the engine out the exhaust now this one's pretty neat got a little bitty uh dipstick here so you can uh you know measure the amount inside and tell you when to empty it all engines are going to produce some blow by if your engine produces a lot of it it's just a good indication that you, uh, you know, your piston rings and stuff are getting worn. So there you go. That's what we're going to plumb in. And that's a basic idea of how this thing is working. Let's see if we can't, you know, maybe mount it to the side of the uh, air conditioner box or something. So I started to mount this thing to the AC box, but it's fiberglass and pretty thin. And this stuff, this thing's got a little gravity to it. And then I was like, well, you know, we'll just use some self-tappers and put it against the firewall and then again I'm like that's kind of cheesy so what I'm going to do is mount it to the firewall but I'm going to use a couple of these nut certs whatever uh, that will give me positive voltage and keep this thing from falling off onto the exhaust manifold and you know make my truck go up in flames so there's the tool that actually you know crimps these little inserts and just screw off this die it's got all sorts of different thread dies for, you know, different stuff.
so I'm going to go from the exhaust or from the valve cover into the inlet side. Maybe I want to look halfway decent. Not too much extra hose, but enough. Probably about like that, maybe. Yeah, we'll call that good. Wrap a little bit of this tape around here. This is steel braided. It's actually fuel line, but it's all I got. So, we'll use this. And we'll cut it right in the middle of that tape. That way, that steel braiding doesn't spray out everywhere. Really, some, you know, 6AN or something fittings would be nice, but it doesn't really need it. It'd look better. Latch is sharp. All right, so I've got it hooked up here, and now we need to go out into the intake. I got a vacuum port here on the intake that I'm going to hook to. get the idea right now we should be vented right what's Cora doing huh are you enjoying the day girl Cora's doing pretty good she's stray obviously we've uh, taken care of her as best as we can she seems to be doing good she's an awesome little dog she listens pretty well and she's relatively calm and uh, I don't know I mean, what else could you ask for? She's a good little shop dog. Isn't that right? Yeah, she's good. Oh, goodness. Okay, we're just about done. I think we are. Now, we've got this side of it done. We've got our PVC valve tied into our intake. We've got our catch can system tied into the intake here so now we've got a vacuum that goes through this catch can to this pvc valve relieving any current case pressure from the engine but what we need at least every other pvc system i've ever seen has a vent you know like on the other valve cover that either vents up to the air breather or just vents you know through something like this which was here right so this was basically where the exhaust or combustion gases that the engine generated come out under the hood. Now this is going to be used as a fresh air intake into this valve cover here. So it'll draw fresh air in this side through the engine, out you know, the PVC valve into the catch can and back into the engine and have no more exhaust gases, combustion gases, whatever, venting under the hood. That's the idea. So I'm going to pull this other Valve cover off and drill a hole in it. So check out the behind on this thing now with a brand new aftermarket step bumper. Man, that sure makes them look nice. Uh, new chrome on the back end. Big thanks to my buddy Ron for the help on this thing. From LMC, I believe. Uh, didn't fit quite as good as the original. The bracketry 
original bracketry uh, was a little off, but I just had to make some spacers uh, on each side, and that's it, really. It fit the truck itself really good, except for the way that it mounts. I had to do some adjusting on it. And this one does not have uh, holes out here for you know cross mounts. It just bolts right in the center. That one rusted out right where those mounts were, so I don't guess that's a bad thing. Uh, maybe not quite as strong as far as a you know angled impact, but hopefully we don't get impacted at all. Um, Got to get my antique tag on here and my Chevrolet emblem, and this thing will be finished up from behind. Looks pretty good. This little rusty crusty hitch that I spray painted, you know, doesn't look too great, but it does work good. So I'm going to keep it on there. But there you go. Looks good really good I think So, use the old do-all drill press here with a step bit to drill out our valve cover. Oh wow, that is running out like crazy. Maybe I need to change its position. Goodness. So check out how much that drill bit is running out on this big do-all drill press. I think this chuck, I don't know, I think it's got some wear in it. I'm gonna pull this one out of this drill press and uh, swap it with the other one and see if that stops that run out. I think, the, I think that'll fix it, I don't know, we'll see. Let's knock it out and uh, try a chuck swap and see if we can get it to run truer than what it is. Maybe it's this bit. Probably is. Try a different one. Let's see. Let's see. How about now? Yep. Hmm. Wasn't the chuck. This bit has some run out. Okay. So for drilling large holes in thin sheet metal, uh, step bits work amazingly well.
raise the table a bit. gracious. right up. I'll probably have to mess with the idle a little bit uh, and the idle mixture screws get it tweaked back in because it's going to have a slight vacuum leak at idle. So I took this thing out, drove it quite a bit. It, it runs excellent with the uh, uh, PCV system. I did have to adjust the idle circuit on this carburetor, richen it up a bit, and tweak the idle screw, which you know kind of go hand in hand there, because we now have a, somewhat of a controlled vacuum leak that I didn't have before. Now people will argue to run a PCV valve. Some people argue just use a crankcase breather, um, and there's pros and cons to both, right? There's no free lunch. Um, I think on a primarily street-driven vehicle that a PB PCB system is the way to go, personally. It keeps everything from stinking, keeps oil vapor from getting under your hood. It's just a cleaner way externally, although it, without a catch can, you know, that works efficiently, you know, you're going you're gonna to have some of that unburnt uh, vapor or what, engine oil, whatever, go into your intake and it's going to cause uh, buildup and stuff on on your valves and whatnot you know if if it's not working properly and i can guarantee you a hundred percent that this check valve or this pvc valve is not working a hundred percent correctly because it wasn't designed this individual valve that i put in this engine was not designed for the vacuum profile of this engine right that's a stock 350 pcv valve that i pulled off the old engine and it's amazing if you really if you're into details, right? Look up proper PCV valve design, and it's there's a lot of science into that because it is a check valve, like I, like I called it earlier, in the reverse direction. So if you get a backfire or something, that pressure can't enter the crankcase and you know cause you big problems. But it's also a proportional valve based on your vacuum profile of your engine that allows just enough flow through to ventilate your crankcase. Uh, depending on whether you're at idle, run, pulling a load, right, or wide open throttle, right, your profile of vacuum changes, and that valve is supposed to regulate how much flow goes through this engine ventilation-wise uh, based on that. And I can guarantee you it's not right. Getting the right one, you know, for this engine would be very, very tough. So if you're interested, the one guy out there that may find this slightly interesting, I know I'm boring to death a lot of people but look into it i think you'll find it interesting pcv valve uh, design i know i've learned a bunch about it i know very little but 
you know, I know a lot more now than what I did a few days ago just by, you know, being curious enough to look it up. So at least we got a functioning system. It may not be optim optimized, but we do have a functioning system. Come here. I want to show you something. So this truck has become relatively nice. And I want to make it just a tad bit harder than it is to steal right now. Because at the moment, just keep this between me and you. You don't have to have a key to run this truck. See that key? That's the original keyage. And only thing it has on it is just, I mean, very small bumps. They're, it's almost smooth, really. And I just stick it in there for show a lot of times when I'm driving around. But look, you can turn the key on and off and it doesn't make any difference. It still turns. So I want to make this truck just a little bit harder to steal than somebody just being able to get in the truck and turn the ignition and it take off. Um, a viewer was nice enough to send me this brand new lock cylinder with two new key sticks that I will probably promptly lose. But anyway, at least for a short period of time with this new lock cylinder, this truck will be much harder to take than what it is right now. So quickly, let's pull out this lock cylinder, change it, then we will unbury the Dewall Melon machine. <clears throat> so a lot of people get eh, pretty bent out of shape when it comes to the thought of tearing into a steering column. Because there is a few odds and ends pieces in there, you have to have a steering wheel puller and, uh, you know, some of the parts are jammed in there, but really it's not that bad. If a person, you know, that's a bit mechanically inclined just gets into one, you know, you pretty quickly find out that they're, they're not all that bad. I'm going to mark the steering wheel that way I get it because it's straight and get it right back in the same spot. If we keep this on the same spline, this splines onto the shaft, you know, our marks will help. So I have seen keys more worn than this one, but not by a whole lot. Not much left of that thing, actually. Now, you could have a new key made for this cylinder, but you can you can bet that if the key's worn this bad, this cylinder is as, as well. And that is the case, because I can see where on this little cam in there, this thing's just had it. But, you know, lasted, I'm sure this is probably the original, lasted 38 years. Well, I guess it's time to unbury this do all milling machine. So even though I don't have a lot of time this week, I still want to push forward on it 
and see if I can't at least get it to a point to where I can start back working on it. Let's get this big box out of the way if we can. Speaking of this box, man, you know, I know everybody doesn't agree, but these Harbor Freight boxes for the money are absolutely awesome. I love mine. Cora, you want to grab that end? Come on, grab onto my arm and pull. So this is the Duol milling machine. I was working on this project up until about a year ago when I stopped it in order to take on the truck project. And now that it's done, it's never done. They're never done. But I can say that now and get away with it because it's basically complete. I want to pick back up where I left off on this milling machine and, and complete it. Now, this machine, a lot of people worked on it. Adam Booth, Lance Baltzy, Keith Rucker, Brian Block. If you're interested in some of the videos that I've done on this, which is, was quite a few, go back in my archives of videos about a year ago and you will find this milling machine and what we've done to get it to the point that it is now. I remember working on this with uh, Walnut the Squirrel. Some of you will remember Walnut climbing up on me while I was working on this. So it's been a little while ago. We pulled the knee off of it. We pulled the table off. We sent both of those off to have them ground because this machine was picked up by my buddy Al and brought to me. And it just happened to have quite a bit of scoring wear, not scoring wear, but scoring damage to the machine ways on the knee. So we sent those off, had them ground. I've got them both back here. Keith Rucker and I worked on the Gibbs, uh, Lance Baltzy and Adam Booth and I and I believe Brian Block worked on the saddle here. So all of these parts are ready to start fitting back together. All I have to do is remember where I was at basically in the assembly and start putting it back together. It's going to take a while. We're not going to get too far in this video. Probably nowhere. Probably just get this thing unburied to be honest because I'm running out of time. But I am super excited to get back started on this project. Now, just to touch on this for anybody who's new to the channel, this is a 40 taper spindle, which is awesome in my opinion. It has a four inch diameter spindle. So this is a pretty beefy milling machine really for a knee mill. It's lots of cast iron in this thing. It has power down feed, it has power feed in all directions, X, Y, and Z, as far as the table and the, and the knee goes. Coolant system that's never been used, as far as I can tell, is brand new on this thing. So I cannot wait to get this thing fitted all back together and working the way that it should. It will take a while, but I think that it is very doable and uh, I'm excited to get back started on it. But first thing that I have to do really is just get this area cleaned up to where I can get started back on this thing. So we'll do that and uh, see how far we get. So this big chunk of cast iron here is the reason why this milling machine got tore down. I just want to get people up to speed if, if you're not. Now this is the knee of the machine. This goes on to the main casting. The saddle goes on top of this, slides front to back. And then table, which we had ground as well, goes on top of the saddle and moves side to side. So this had some extensive uh, scoring on the machine ways here and would have caused this machine most likely to be really inaccurate. It had quite a bit of wear in here due to lack of lubrication, what I think, on the saddle and on the ways. That is quite a heavy table for uh, this knee being as narrow as it is or this machine way. So instead of grinding out all of the scoring, we can see the damage there, we elected to not do that and just grind it back flat and just uh, leave this here, although not very pleasing to the eye. As far as mechanically, this scoring damage here shouldn't hurt anything. So, you know, that I just want to, you know, t fill everybody in on that. This is the reason that that machine was tore down. And now it's, it's extremely flat, even though it does still have what looks like damage on it, which what is damage, you know, this has been ground nice and flat and should be. Uh, really as accurate or more accurate than probably what it was brand new. So here is our machine Gibbs. We've got three of them here. One, two, and three. This one's for the table. This one's for the saddle or for the knee. And then this one 
is for the saddle. Now, me and Keith Rucker and uh, Brian Block, I believe, uh, scraped one side of these flat. Now, these have to be scraped to fit the machine, and we'll do that, you know, as we get this thing to a point to where, you know, we're starting to fit everything together. Hello, Cora. Hello, girl. So it's been a long time since I've used my Caterpillar lift. I'm curious to see, should still work. I had it on the trickle charger. This thing is awesome, by the way. I picked this up, a lot of you will remember, I picked it up right after I got done with the, or basically right after I got done with the construction of this building, and I used it a ton. Uh, I've already got my money's worth out of it. So even though it's been a year plus since I worked on this thing, thankfully, when I did tear it apart, I videoed a lot of it. A lot of you guys will remember that. But also, I was disciplined enough, for the most part anyway, to label everything. And I used my shop notebook for all of the wires and stuff. They're all red. But they do have numbers on them, which I wrote down. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to, to get that back right. That's one of my major concerns is that, you know... I messed that up, but I don't think that I will, but it's possible. Luckily, I labeled that stuff and also kept the majority of the fasteners, you know, with the components that they go with. This is the uh, lead screw for the saddle back and forth for the uh, Y-axis. And then we've got all of our components uh, stuffed in these few bins here. Also, you know, I was thankfully good enough to label the screws, bag them. These are feed gearbox screws which mean they're going to go in that feed gearbox and attach it to the bottom of the saddle so i do have my work cut out for me that's for sure um, but nothing here is going to be all that complicated but there will be quite a bit of relearning to do that's for sure so if you look at the main casting here i don't know how well you can see it but all of the flaking marks are really nice and even from one end to the other even the dovetails are really good on this thing. I don't believe that this machine was used a ton. I think that it developed the issue that, uh, you know, with the saddle and the knee, and then it was kind of put out of service. But you can see this kept pretty well. We got a little bit of corrosion starting there. But before I put this thing, or before I stopped on this, I did what you see here, just sprayed some WD-40 on the ways. And even though I've never been the biggest fan of WD-40, you know, for some things, it's pretty good, and uh, it does leave behind a nice film, you know, that protects pretty well. But for this purpose, I believe there are better products, but, you know, if you got it, you know, it works.
So this big casting here is the saddle. This sets directly on top of the knee here, hopefully that's in frame, slides back and forth, and then the table slides on these ways, you know, right to left, right? So this part is basically done. Um, the bottom here, that was scraped in by me, and uh, no, it was just flaked. It was machined on my shaper and then uh, flaked to give it a little oil retention on this side here. Let me get you a better shot. So these machine ways here are done. They just need cleaned up a bit where it's set. Uh, uh, well, I say done, they're not done. I need to put in my oil grooves on this surface here to uh, facilitate uh, nice oil retention on, on these machine surfaces. Uh, I machined these on the shaper and then uh, checked it on the surface plate in comparison to the top here, which is where the table rides back and forth. So this is done other than, you know, mounting it to the knee of this machine, the big casting here, and fitting the gib. So this is the knee, and if you look at the back here, it's still got all of the original flaking still in it. So there'll be basically very little, if anything, that needs done to these machine ways here. And technically, uh, I guess I could take this knee and you know, mount it on the machine, clean it up, mount it on the machine, you know, and then work using the machine as my table, which is probably what I will do. Oh, I am super excited about getting back started on this. I think it'll go together, well, it'll take a while, but it'll go together relatively quick. It shouldn't take a year, that's for sure. So even touching these parts, really, just jogs my memory back on this disassembly and, uh, you know, kind of how much I enjoyed uh, tearing this thing into, tearing into this thing, you know, uh, solving the problems or trying to solve the problems, um, you know, doing the investigating work, trying to figure out why it failed to begin with. You know, I, I do. I really like this kind of stuff. Unfortunately, I can't do any more this week or else we won't have a video because I'm out of time. But I guess next week, maybe we'll get set up, try to get the knee on this thing and... Uh, and go from there. We'll see. Um, I'm excited to get started back on this thing. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever, I much appreciate it. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.